All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming out and attending today. Uh, we're going to be covering building your own investment portfolio, retirement portfolio, um, investing in real estate. And I also wanted to announce that September 11th next month, we're having a top agent panel. So it's going to be a very exciting and fun training event where we're going to have three agents, three different markets come up here and kind of tell us about their business, their challenges, their struggles, but also what led to their success, all the great tools that they use, uh, their business strategies, and just help us all get a different approach from what agents are doing in different markets, as well as what's working today, as there's always changes and some uh, new uh, nuances that you can either adapt to or be good to know and be aware of. So we're gonna be covering that in September with the top agent panel. So jumping in today, uh, again, I'm Olivier Lewis. I own Remax First Realty 2 in Cranford with my partner, Carl Sanfilippo. And due to it being his birthday tomorrow, uh, we gave him the day off. We decided to give him the day off, or rather he took the day off, and uh, I will be presenting today. So getting into why today's topic is today's topic is a little bit about my story. For those of you who've heard this already, sorry, but uh, for anyone else interesting, I went to school for finance, graduated from Kane University right here in New Jersey, and wasn't the right time to look for a job. I graduated in a December after December semester. So I went and got my real estate license. Two weeks past the exam, and I think it was like first week of January, and I got a call from a new real estate company, uh, I wanna say startup, and I said, you know what, let me just go for the interview. It's not the right time to look for a job in finance. So I went for the interview. Really liked the concept and said, I'm gonna try this out, It'll give me some time to look for the right gig in Manhattan, go work on Wall Street or whatever, but in the meantime, I'll learn about this real estate industry and have some income while I'm looking for a job. Rest is history. Never left, never worked a day in finance. My whole career has been in real estate. And the reason that I wanted my real estate license is uh, myself and my parents, we immigrated here, and my parents had GEDs, you know, no college education, and they did well for themselves and provided for myself and my siblings through real estate. My father bought his first home, which was a two family, and then he leveraged that and bought a four family, and then another four family, and that's how they were able to supplement their income to be able to support four kids. We never needed anything, um, always had food on the table. Uh, all of us went through and graduated college. And it's interesting with just a basic GED and very entry level jobs that they were able to do that. I sometimes look back like, how in the world did they do it? But they did. And a lot of it was through the passive income that they were receiving from these multifamilies. So that's what sparked me getting into real estate. And then obviously falling in love, the rest is history. Uh, I just, I realized it was my DNA. So that's why I want to talk about building your investment portfolio, talk about some multifamilies, talk about how to build passive income. Um, it's a very near and dear topic to me because I kind of grew up on it. So that's our topic for today. So who here loves selling real estate? All of us, right? You got to be totally passionate about it to do what we do and wait for that paycheck that hopefully comes at the end. So you got to love it. I love it. Um, everyone loves it for a lot of different reasons. When I talk to agents and I ask them why they get into it, uh, for some people it's income. For some people, they enjoy helping people. It's fulfilling, it's rewarding when you put that buyer and seller into a home and you see that smile or they cry, right? There, there's a lot of rewards that come with it. Uh, for some, they like making their own schedule. They have a lot of other things going on. Uh, you're getting to be a business owner. This is a business, it's not a job. It's not so much a career, you're running a business. For a lot of people, it's because going back to school, or two-week course, right? <laughs> so the barrier of entry is very easy. Two weeks, you pass, and now you're running a business. 
And a lot of people just wanted to be business owners and be their own boss, not have to answer to someone. So selling real estate, if you're passionate about it, it can be a great thing. No caps, no income ceiling, sky's the limit. You get what you put into it. You want to make a couple hundreds of thousands. You can do a million in GCI. You can work 30 hours a week and make six figures and be very comfortable. Uh, we all love it. We all raised our hands. But who really wants to sell real estate forever? No one, right? But in our industry, people don't talk about retirement. They don't talk about succession planning. And it's go. We're coming off the spring market. Deals are closing. Those direct deposits are hitting your account, right? Everyone's happy. Then we get into fall. People are getting ready for the holidays, Thanksgiving. People are buying new outfits for realtor spring break, which is triple play. <laughs> right? It's exciting times for us. Uh, then, of course, holidays, and then you're gearing up for spring. You're doing your business plans, and, and you're ready for the war room, and you know, you're looking at your CRM, and do I have everything in place, and let me get new business cards and headshots, because you're gearing up for that spring market where it's peak season for us. Then you go through the spring market, then you're here in August again, and it's the cycle. A couple years later, five years, 10 years later, you look up and you've just been in that cycle. So, newsflash, the cycle will continue. You're all gonna do great, but retirement's nearing. And that's where, listen, if you enjoy real estate like we all do, we all raised our hands, that's great. And if you wanna sell real estate at 70, 75, 80, I've, I've had colleagues that were in those ages um, in the office. And listen, if you want to do it for social reasons, because it gives you something to do, if you're still active and your friends, kids are calling you and you really enjoy it, that's fine, right? If you want to do it for those reasons, it gives you something to do, you're still actively selling, um, you enjoy it, you really can't get over those epic triple play parties, so you want to keep going. <laughs> If you're doing it at that age, that's fine. But if you have to do it because you can't live off Social Security and you can't retire, that's a challenge. So that's what we're going to talk about to avoid. When can you afford to retire? These are stats that I looked up. 22% uh, of U.S. workers are confident they'll have enough saved for retirement. That's a very low number, 22%. And that's confident. That's not actual. Right? So that number, the actual number may be lower. 45% of Americans have no retirement savings whatsoever, including 40% of baby boomers. No retirement savings. Guys, we're in an industry where you can build your own retirement savings through your work. And there's a lot of rewards, there's a lot of easy steps. We kind of have the cheat sheet because we have intellectual knowledge of being realtors. We have access to the MLS, we have access to the inventory, we have access to all the financing options. There is no reason why realtors should ever fall in this bucket because this is what we do for a living. We have means. Now I did Google also, uh, retirement plan for realtors, and all the stuff that came up were 401ks, Roth IRAs, this, that, and the other. And for a lot of people that have a very good problem of making too much for a Roth IRA, IRA you can't do that, right? And you're subject to the market. Right now we've been in a bull market for the last couple of years, it's great, but the stock market takes a turn, your investment will take a turn with it. So why not invest in real estate? A Couple more stats, um, according to the Center of Retirement Research, more than 50% of all working households are at risk of not being able to keep up with their standard of living. That's not gonna be anyone in this room, correct? Because we're gonna learn to invest if you're not already doing it. Uh, so. I really feel that take advantage of what's out there, take advantage of what we do for a living, and make yourself a client. So again, if you enjoy selling real estate and you want to do it in your golden years, that's great. The alternative is you'll be working at Silent Generation Realty, which is the pre-baby boomers. And I looked this up, that age group before the baby boomers is called Silent Generation. You don't want to be forced to be there. Right? If you want to do it for fun, that's great, but we're going to talk about how to tic-tac-toe and grow your dough for retirement. So what you're really working towards is income. Saving money is great, but something happens, you could spend your savings, right? You can all blow through your savings. 
What you really want is income. So residual income is the key. Whether you buy a property, there's a lot of different factors and a lot of different benefits that you will have besides the residual income. Let's talk about some of them. Property value appreciation is one. Typically, like inflation, the values go up. So you will benefit from the property values going up. And guys, in a down market like we came out of, there are things that happen. You go into a recession, there are things that happen. But generally speaking, property values go up over time like inflation. So you buy properties, you have that going for you. Common denominator is always going to be residual income because that's the goal, right? You want residual income. You can't just rely on Social Security. Then also you're building equity. As your mortgage gets paid down and the property value appreciation happens, you build equity. Tenants get to pay down, pay off your mortgage. No one likes mortgages. Anyone in here likes a mortgage? Wants a mortgage? We don't like them. We don't want them, but we need them in order to acquire property. But here's the great thing, and I have this saying, everyone pays a mortgage. It's either yours or your landlord's, right? So put yourself in the landlord's position where you get the tenant to pay off the mortgage for you. So that's another great, great key with uh, multifamily and investing in real estate. Tenants pay off your mortgage, you get the residual income, and you're growing your net worth as you're building equity. You're writing off the interest. The interest is a write-off for your taxes. So yes, you're paying interest, but you get to write it off. You also get property tax deductions. Now that's changed. Um, there's a ceiling, it's 10,000 cap. Uh, your accountant can get into that a little bit more, which isn't great for anyone investing and has multiple properties, but you still get somewhat of a write-off. And last but not least, a couple other things is secure asset and depreciation write-offs, which depreciation write-offs is a tax term where they, do, they, where they can write off some depreciations. But let's talk about secure assets, because someone rebuttaled me the other day when talking about this, that, oh yeah, but I bought these properties in 06, 07, and then the market crashed, and I was screwed, so it's just like the stock market. And I said, no. If you had rental properties that you purchased in 2004, 5, 6, 7, or 8, as long as you were not in an arm loan that adjusted, you should be fine. Because rents do not go down, nor did they go down, right? Supply and demand, rents actually rose. So unless you were in an arm loan that adjusted and your payment spiked up, you should have been fine if you kept that property. Wasn't the right time to sell it maybe, right? Because values were down, but as a landlord, the rental market got stronger. So I still believe it is one of the more secure assets you can have. So what to buy? I have an ABC strategy. And A properties are the class A buildings or the best type of property. They're renovated, they're updated, they're in great towns, they're in great locations, they're ideal. They cost you more because they're in great shape, whether it's a new construction or rehab or it's in a really nice town, your short hills of investing, uh, but your cash flow and your passive income is less because you're paying more for this property. So it's funny, my wife is always telling me, find an investment property in our town, and I'm like, you find it because the cash flow and the numbers are tough where I live. The multifamilies are so expensive that when you look at the numbers, you're not really making money on it on a monthly basis. And I like to look at it as income. Some people look at it as building equity, and over time they're going to pay it off, but I like the cash flow. But for some people that don't want the headaches, they want the cream of the crop tenants, right? And they want to be very close to home if you live in a nice town or you want life to be easy or they want new construction because they never want to pick up a hammer or a screwdriver, Class A properties are for you. Uh, Class B properties are well-maintained, but not top-notch, right? So there's some equity there. You're getting a good deal. Uh, I'm not saying it's a fixer-upper, but you may have to, over time, put some sweat equity into it. But you typically start to get decent cash flow because you're buying them under value or you're getting them at a good price where the numbers work. So figure out 
what you can stomach. Because if you don't ever want to pick up a screwdriver, if you never want to call that there's a plumbing leak, right? A class B property may not be for you. And then for those that are just hardcore investors, class C properties, those are distressed. They're your foreclosures, they're your short sales, they're your estate sales that need to be completely updated, not maintained homes. Um, those will require a large capital Im improvement. You're going to have to put some money into them. They're not moving ready, but those are op actually one of the best opportunities because with that capital and improvement, you can turn it to a class A property without paying the class A price. So you automatically get to build an equity. You get to customize it, renovate the home. You know what the buyers or tenants rather are looking for in today's market. You outfit it with the white cabinets, gray walls, all the open concept, right? The granite counters. You make it their luxury rental and you can max that out as well as not maxing out your budget and going into something with equity. But you have to figure it out. If Class C isn't for you, if you don't have contractors, if you're not ready to do a project, if you don't have the means to do the uh, capital and improvement, that's not what you need to do. Maybe you look at a Class A property, smooth sailing, turnkey, and yes, you may not have the best cash flow up front, but over time, the equity will catch up. So just read, uh, for, for those of you that have read this, you'll remember this line, pay yourself first. Richest man in Babylon, right? Pay yourself first. And that's part of what we're talking today. You got to take care of yourselves. You guys should be your own clients, right? So pay yourself first. And in the book, he talked about how he took 10% off the top of every dollar he made. Anything he sold, anything he, any income that was received, 10% came off the top. And with the 10%, what he did with it was reinvested that 10%. And it grew legs. And it compounded. So that's how he became the richest man in Babylon. And richer than the king, richer than everyone else, because he paid himself first. So pay yourself first. Because no one else is going to pay you. So you have to build for retirement. So let's talk about some of the different types of properties because you can go a lot of different ways with this. First, there are people that invest in single families. Not ideal to me, and if you are doing it, I'm not saying it's wrong. I don't personally love single family investments as a portfolio type of product because of the maintenance. You're responsible for the snow. You're responsible for the sidewalks when the trees uproot them. You're responsible for the lawn care. And yeah, you may get the tenants to do it, but ultimately, the snow doesn't get shoveled, someone falls, you're responsible, not the tenant. Um, you're responsible for the roof, the paint on the exterior or siding. There's a lot more maintenance to have one rent roll and if the tenant leaves or in the process of leaving, you have a vacancy, you're 100% responsible for the mortgage. So a lot of people buy a single family and then decide to move to a bigger one and they keep that as an investment. In that case, you already have it, that may not be bad, but I would not look to purchase single families that are detached especially because you become responsible for so much. Um, I would not look to do that as, hey, that's the way I'm gonna build my portfolio. Caveat, duplexes work, right? You're sandwiched in, it's basically a townhouse or a condo. So you're responsible for a little bit less, you have less property. So that may make sense, no driveways to asphalt, right? So it's a little bit less maintenance. I know a lot of people that build portfolios with condos and townhomes, they're great. They get a little bit better. Why? No sidewalks, no shoveling, no lawn care, no roofs. You're not responsible for any of that. So it makes your life easy. Turnkey, you're responsible for what's in the four walls. And if you have good tenants, hopefully you're not getting called over there a lot. The one con, which is a trade-off, is people say, ah, yeah, but you have the HOAs. Well, the HOAs allow you to not be responsible for any exterior maintenance. So it is a trade-off. But you are subject to the special assessments if the complex needs to make some kind of capital improvement. But again, if you tell me I can build a portfolio and never have to show up because all the exterior stuff is being taken care of, that's great. I'll give you guys a, a, a real example of landlord headaches. Let's call it that. Uh, so we have our building in Cranford where our office is located. And every time it snows, I get a pit in my stomach because 
I have to be responsible, right? And it's a blizzard. I have a real wheel drive car, which doesn't get out in the snow. And we have a big parking lot, which I can't shovel. So I found a guy, thanks to my wife from Facebook, that has a company, he's a property manager. So he lives in Cranford, it's easy. He was going to shovel it. It was very inexpensive. I'll tell you guys, it was 100 bucks because it took him 15 minutes with his plow on his truck. Things were great. It snowed, I just sent him a text, please do my office. The last snowstorm of the year, I won't forget this. Sent him a text, please do my office. I'm in Jamaica. And I'm like, oh no, this is bad. You call these landscaping companies, if you don't have an account with them, they will not service you because they have routes. I had to learn that the hard way. So after about 12 to 15 calls, I found someone who totally hosed me. $400. Sorry, Carl, if I didn't tell you this. Uh, <laughs> but as a landlord, you have to know that this is what comes with it. Then what was even more frustrating is I got to the office and it winded up melting to slush. And I saw the guys pushing slush and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. But uh, that's why some people go for condos and townhomes. You don't have those challenges, right? The HOA is taking care of it. So there's a lot of benefits to that. Two to four unit multifamilies, ideal and target properties. They're perfect because you have multiple tenants multiple streams of income. Look at every tenant as a stream of income. Multiple streams of income under one roof, one door. So if you told me, do I want three single families versus one three family, I'll take the one three family all day long. I don't have three roofs, I have one. I don't have three boilers to service, I have one. I don't have three electric panels, I have one. Well, technically you might have three. But you guys see the point. I don't have three driveways to shovel. So it makes my life a lot easier. So two to four families is the goal. You can start off with condos and townhomes. They're easier to acquire, obviously less money, et cetera. But you want to get to two to four family units. Good cap rates, and you have multiple tenants in one roof. You're not going to three different locations to collect rents. And last but not least, commercial properties, five units or more. That's when things are working. But at that point, you may need some help. FYI. You go to evict a tenant in a single family, a condo, or a two to four family, you can do it yourself. Process is very simple. You go to evict a tenant in a mixed use commercial five unit or more, and you're in an LLC, you need an attorney. You cannot represent yourself once the property's in an LLC. And even when you try to buy commercial, a lot of the banks will, even if you're financing it personally, a lot of the banks will make you put it in an LLC, and I just had that happen. So. Five units or more, you probably need help. Whether it's an attorney, whether it's a property management company. Hey, you guys are all realtors. You guys have all the tools and resources. You might be able to do it yourself. But a lot of people do outsource that because they want to focus on their core business, which is being a realtor, right? Real quick uh, article. I'm sure a lot of people have seen this because it was all over the news. Because people say, Olivier, this sounds great. I want to invest. I want to retire. I want this stuff, but raising capital. This was on the news and I saw this, so I had to t incorporate this in. Five friends purchased their first property after saving $50 per week for two years. Incredible, right? Where there's a will, there's a way. If you guys want to invest, it could start off with $50 a week. And that just was two weeks ago. So amazing story of how a group of guys said, we want to invest, we don't have it, but together we can. And hopefully that spirals into multiple properties. But let's talk about raising capital. Not everyone's where they want to be today financially, but that doesn't mean you should not invest. That doesn't mean you shouldn't pay yourself first. So multiple ways that you can save the capital to do this, the old fashioned way of, sa of saving, pay yourself first. Maybe because I just read this book, this is going to keep flowing off the tip of my tongue. Pay yourself first, right? Save the money. It gets hard. So let's talk about some other options. Take that one larger commission check and reinvest it. I'll tell you guys a true story. 2009, and I started selling real estate in 2008. Tough times, but I'm not giving myself a pat on the back, but tough times to start becoming an agent. And 2009, I found a house. It was a foreclosure. Um, I had a pipeline, I had a couple deals closing, and I put a nice size deal under, under contract. 
friend of mine is an REO broker. I was going through his list of properties and I saw something that came up in Westfield. So I'm like, Westfield? Wow, foreclosure in Westfield. I never previewed homes, ever. But I said to myself, let me go look at this because I have a ton of buyers and of course everyone would take Westfield. So I go preview this home and I call him and I say, what are you listing this for? And he told me and I said, wow, I think I'll buy it. Oh, sorry, I don't know how to turn that off. Um, sorry guys. But I previewed the home and I said, what are you gonna list this for? Because I think I'm interested. And he told me the number and I said, wow, I am interested. Brought my girlfriend at the time, now wife, to this, to this house and she's like, why are we looking at a house for your client? And I said, well, tell me what you think about it. And she said, I love it, but why, are we look, why do you need my opinion? And I said, because I want to buy this. And she said at the time, wait, we don't have the money. And I said, I do. I got it. Don't worry. I felt like um, Mr. Biggs in Sex and the City. <laughs> like, I got this. Um, but long story short, I took that big commission check. I had just put a deal under contract that was about 600 grand and I was getting 3% commission. What was my down payment, guys? Three and a half, right? So that deal pretty much funded my down payment. Now, if, you, if there was ever a deal that I made sure closed and doubled down on every little step, it was that deal because now this could not die, right? But I took that big transaction instead of just putting it in the bank and letting it get commingled with all my other bills and getting engaged and all this other stuff I said it's better that I invest this money because I had other deals in my pipeline so taking that large commission check and rather than going shopping you know you, you wanted that Louis Vuitton bag or you wanted that nice watch or new car invest it take that large commission check uh, financial partners you can find them 80-20s are coming back. For those of you that don't know, a conventional 80% loan, you get a second mortgage for the 20% down payment, that becomes 100% financing, that is coming back. Taking money out of your 401k, taking money out of your investment accounts. If it's sitting there and you're realizing that whatever investment portfolio it's in is generating me 3% or it's going down or 4 or 5% and it's really not growing and it's enough for a down payment on a house, why would you leave it there? Uh, last but not least, joint venturing. A lot of people do. I've been approached by a lot of people, so I know what happens. Hey, I'd love to do a joint venture with you. Let's buy this property together. Uh, you manage it. I'll put up some money. However it works, joint ventures happen. And it's a, not a bad way to acquire property. Just realize it's a marriage. So you got to make sure that that's the right person that you're getting married to in business. But that is a way to acquire properties. And over time, maybe someone buys someone else out. Or maybe everything works great and you keep the property. Or at a certain point, you sell it. And now you have a down payment to go buy your own. But there are some options. You can raise the capital. Not having the money today is not a reason why in a year or two, you're not able to buy that first investment property if you don't already have one. Crowd peer-to-peer -peer funding, that's an example of what these five guys did um, to purchase their first property. So let's talk about how to finance these properties. So now we've raised some money, right? We identified what we want to buy. Did you have a question? OK. We identified what we want to buy. We talked about the different types of properties. We figured out how to raise money and build capital. So now let's talk about what you need to finance properties. And as realtors, this is one of the tough things. Taxes, taxes, taxes. You have to pay your taxes. Had an agent. I, we do these weekly one-on-ones. Uh, and he came to me and last week's topic was financial advice. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I wear a broker's hat. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not an accountant. And it, it was more so towards budgeting for their business. But then we got into this personal stuff because it's all commingled. But bottom line is you have to present yourself. I'm sorry, prepare yourself for opportunity. You got to have your taxes paid. If I put a deal on the table today, and you don't have your taxes filed, how are you going to finance it? Agents have said to me, oh, I'll do hard money. Great. Good luck with that, trying to hold a portfolio property with 9 to 12% interest. It's not realistic. And they're short-term one-year loans. What happens after the year? you got to refinance. You need your taxes. So besides the fact that you should already be paying your taxes, you will need your taxes because you need the income. 
If you have multiple properties, this is a pitfall that so many people fall under, is that they have one or two or three properties and they don't claim the rental income. So what happens is you go to apply for a mortgage, Olivier just put a great deal in front of me or you found something on the MLS and because you're not paying income, I'm sorry, because you're not paying taxes on the rental income, your lender is gonna hold that debt against you. So now your income, whatever it be, 50, 100, 200 grand, is diminished because they're saying, well, you're carrying your primary residence, you're carrying property A here in Edison, and you're carrying property B here in New Brunswick. So because you're carrying all these homes, you can't get a new mortgage. Even though that other property looks like it's gonna pay itself, um, the debt is weighing you down. So two things with taxes. One, you gotta pay them. Um, two, if you do have other properties, you have to claim the income. You can't just say to your lender, oh yeah, yeah, I get two, 3,000 a month from that property. I can show you pay stubs for, I'm sorry, um, cancel checks or uh, rent receipts that I get, provide the tenants. If it's not on your taxes, they're not gonna claim the income. It has to be there. So that's a pitfall that a lot of landlords fall under. And I get it, you wanna dumb down what you pay your silent partner, right? We all have this silent partner, it doesn't show up for anything, doesn't have to take the calls, but then gets a third. Uh, we all try to diminish that amount, but if you do, you have to be careful because if you don't claim any of the taxes on the other rent rental income, you won't be able to get a mortgage. Um, last but not least, FHA is available. And a lot of people don't know this, but you can have multiple FHA loans. Is that news to anyone? You, you can have multiple FHA loans. So, I'm sorry, even if your uh, property is, you have a primary residence, the second loan could be FHA? No, works backwards, okay. in, in the reverse of that rather. Uh, but this is key if you have someone that wants to build a portfolio and doesn't own a home, take advantage of this. Honestly, I wish I would have done this myself because it would have made my life a lot easier. And we're talking about some creative ways to finance properties. But by all means, if you have the 20% to put down, God bless you, put it down every time and just buy the properties that way. But if you're looking for ways to save and do it on a budget, here's an example of how. You can buy a three or four family with an FHA loan. You occupy it for a year. A year later, you can leave that property and go down to a two or one family or a condo or townhome as long as you're going to occupy that. So to answer your question, Stacy, you can't go from a single family to like, hey, Mr. and Mrs. FHA, I think I wanna move into this three family just because I wanna live for free. It won't fly with the underwriter. It doesn't make sense. They're not gonna allow it and they're gonna see that you're just trying to milk the FHA 3.5% down to buy investment properties. But in the reverse, if you don't own a property, you can go from a three down to a two a four down to a three, a four down to a two, you can do it in reverse. And what that allows you to do is maintain that four family or three family with only three and a half percent down. Right? Again, if you have the 20%, you don't have to use this. This isn't the strategy for you. But if you don't have 20% or if you already have a primary residence, you have no choice. You're, you're putting down 20%. If you don't have the 20% and you say, you know what? I don't know if I buy a single family, if I can come up with 20% to buy my investment property, that's a way to do it. Buy the investment property first, then you move into your single family. Do you want to chime in on that? Is it 25% or 20? 25. You buy a single family investment property with 15% down with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but you'll have PMI. But um, you know, most people put 20% down. Yeah, yeah. So you can take advantage of FHA if you're in a position to. If, if you're not and you have the 20%, great, do that. So let's talk about some creative financing. Equity lines are now available again on investment properties. For many, many years, you could not get an equity line on an investment property. Basically after the market crashed, banks realized when things go belly up, people are not gonna pay for their investments. They're gonna take care of the roof over their head. Right, and it makes sense. You're not gonna lose your primary, you're gonna let go of the investments. So for a while, the banks were not loaning via equity lines or refis to cash out on investment properties, but that's back again. Leverage one to buy another. 
You have that first one, you can take the equity line to purchase a second. Going back to the beginning, that's what my father did. He bought his first two family, took an equity line, and purchased a four. Then after a couple years, that four family took an equity line, purchased another four family. So that's why this is kind of in my DNA growing up around it. And Saturday mornings having to go help my dad instead of playing soccer or whatever sport. But long story short, equity lines are back and it's a good way to allow you to grow your portfolio by using that to purchase more. Okay. Uh, very good question. I never asked my dad, which I'm going to ask him how he learned. Re honestly, I never asked my dad, but I'm going to ask him. I think he just realized that after paying rent for so long and having nothing to show for it, that he needed to own a home. And he liked the idea of having someone help offset the cost. So he bought a two family. And also it allowed us to have other family members live with us because we started off with other family members being tenants. And from there, once it started to work and he realized, wait a minute, the cash flow is allowing me to pay less owning than I was paying rent, that sparked probably the idea of, well, let me go buy a four family. Either that or he had a really good agent that put the idea in his head. <laughs> One of the two, but I will ask, that's a very good question. Um, hopefully it was a very good agent or either way it's a win, right? If he came up with it on his own or a very good agent that introduced him to, to the idea. But you can leverage one to buy another. That's opening up. Delayed financing is a, a way to purchase a property in cash just to win the bid or expedite the process, but then have financing lined up. Uh, personal loans to fund your down payment. This is something new, and I'm going to talk about this because I stumbled upon this by accident. Indirectly, no intent, any financial person. And I will say this, total disclaimer, um, I don't recommend this unless you're experienced or uh, you're very diligent, organized, and are good with money because you're taking on more debt. And frankly, a lot of loan officers will tell you you can't borrow the down payment. But if you're creative and disciplined with money and have experience, it's a way to buy properties with no money down. So I'll quickly get into this story because it's, it's very interesting. Anyone here ever get those notices in the mail from Best Egg, Goldman Sachs, show of hands, like personal loans, 50 to 100,000, you know, three to 10% interest or whatever they say. So I've been getting these for years. We all get them, right? And I'm like, junk mail, junk mail, junk mail. One Sunday, because I, I had this idea of what happens if the market takes a turn in a couple years, I need to be liquid because I want to take advantage of good opportunities that will present themselves. But you can't kind of sit on money because it doesn't make you money. Not that I had money to sit on. Um, and I don't want to sell my investments like waiting for the market to turn, which I don't think it's going to do anytime soon anyway. So I got the junk mail and I was just like, I wonder if these personal loans work. Right? Because in a turn market, I can maybe use that as some capital. So I said, you know what, let me just apply for one. Let's see what happens. And I said, I'll do this. If it works, I'll pay it back. And then I'll have a relationship with this bank. So if I ever needed it, if a deal ever presents itself, I can quickly pull the money out. So I applied. It was a Sunday. Um, got like the instant approval, which I was like, that's weird. Like it's Sunday. You know, how, who's analyzing this? And by Monday, I got this email, we need this, this, and this, we need your routing number, we need your bank information. And I was like, whoa, this is real. So I'm like, I still didn't believe it, right? Unsecured, no leverage, like it's not like they wanted this property or my car or my firstborn, like nothing, right? So I'm like, okay, I'll put in my bank information, I'll, I Google the company, like am I putting this into a legit company? And I'm sitting in the office, I forget about it, Tuesday, and I get an alert from my, my phone, and it's like a deposit of $50,000. And I'm like, what, what, what happened? And I realize, holy cow, that's the personal line of credit. So then I go home and I tell my wife, this thing worked, wow, like unsecured. She's like, so what are you gonna do with it? You're paying interest now. And I'm like, oh, 
Yeah, good question. And I, I, not that I don't need 50 grand, but I didn't need to borrow it at the time. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna pay for a couple months, build a relationship with them, good payment history, and then I'll just pay the thing off. I don't care about paying a couple hundred bucks in interest. So she's like, all right, that makes sense. And I said, then maybe I'll ask for more money and see how, like, how high we can go with this. Right? I'm pushing the envelope. No ceilings here. I got into real estate because I didn't want a ceiling. So I'm pushing the envelope. Guess what? Scrolling through the hot sheet, I think a day later, I see this property and I say to myself, wow, that's a pretty good deal. Let me go look at it. So I went and looked at it and I'm like, wow, these numbers work. And I said, oh, but I can't tie up the money right now and buy this property. My wife's gonna kill me. And I, it like, perfect storm. I'm like, wait a minute. I got the down payment from this personal loan. And I'm like, wait. So I call my mortgage rep and I'm like, uh, can I get a mortgage right away? I don't have my taxes done. <laughs> I'm working on it. I got the rough draft. But um, he's like, yeah, just put it together. Right? I, I put it together and it worked. Here's the property. The closed date is there. And when I say perfect storm, guys, it was the perfect storm. Quick sidebar. As agents, double check how you label properties. This was a three unit, if you can read the remarks. But if you look up here, they had the units down as zero. So this flew under the radar for everyone. Created a perfect deal for Olivier. <laughs> Everyone's like, how did you, how'd you find that? I'm in the MLS all day. Well, this agent mislabeled the property with zero units, although it was a three family, and I got a great deal. So long story short, I call my loan officer, and I'm like, how much do I need to buy a commercial property? He's like, 25%. And I'm like, ouch. But that winded up being purchase price 210, 52.5, and I got 50 grand from this personal loan. Closing cost is another 10. The down payment came from the personal loan. I did a $10,000 seller concession. <laughs> Here's the icing on the cake, guys. I got paid $5,000 to buy the place. <laughs> I got a commission. So my prepaids, so my prepaids, right, and that extra $2,500 came from the commission. I got it right back at closing. But the whole moral to this is not about this particular property. It's that if you want to build an investment portfolio, don't tell me you don't have the means. The money's there. The creative financing is there. Raising capital is possible. It can be done. So this commercial property was technically bought with no money down for me. Now, there's debt, right? I got a personal loan that I have to pay back. The cash flow from the property pays the personal loan back. And the numbers work so that I am cash flow positive even after my vacancy rate, even after my repair budget, which you always put some money aside, that pays the personal loan back. In a couple years, the personal loan's paid off, and I now have this property, no debt other than the mortgage. Um, it creates a simple no money down scenario. And again, I don't encourage this. I'm not telling everyone, go apply for these personal loans. That's on camera. I am not advising that. It's on camera. I am not advising that. But guys, if you need to be creative, and this was by accident. I would have bought this property anyway without the personal loan, but it just so happened that same week that it all came together as a perfect storm. And frankly, if that property were not available, maybe I wouldn't have used the personal loan because there wasn't another deal like this, but it was just literally the perfect storm. So now let's talk about what to do with cash flow. Save for your next purchase. Don't go out and take a vacation should have other means for that. Um, don't go out and buy a new car. Kid you not, I have a client that's a relative, a relative rather, sold them an investment property. Uh, a couple years later, I just was, we were talking about it, never really talked about it. So I, I said, listen, I see rents are going up in whatever town. Uh, you must be doing well, how, how are you managing? He's like, it's great. 
He's like, yeah, it's paying for my new car. And I'm like, ah, that's not ideal. You know, to each their own, do, do with it what you choose. But why don't you save it and invest it, pay down your mortgage, um, or improve the property? He's like, nah, I like the new car instead. <laughs> Couple years later, he goes to sell it. And I'm like, dude, you need a roof? And now he's writing a big check, right? Where you could have used the cash flow to keep the property up. But paying down your mortgage is another thing. Uh, I strongly suggest that because the sooner you can pay down that mortgage, now you have a free and clear asset. But more importantly, your cash flow grows, right? Because you're not paying principal and interest payments. So your rent, after you take out your taxes, insurance, maintenance, escrow, uh, and whatever else, your basic utilities, it's all cash flow. So pay down your mortgage and always take care of the property. You take care of the property, you will be able to rent it for more. If you ever, like I said, you have to position yourself for opportunity. If an opportunity ever arises, and we're gonna talk about this in a couple slides, and you find a bigger investment and you wanna roll it in, you wanna maximize what you're getting out of there. But it has to be in good shape to maximize it. So always try to keep up with the property. Keeping up with the property leads us into property management. Here are some tips, because I, I tell everyone, and we've all had those first-time buyers that want to buy multifamilies. Has anyone kind of walked them through the process? And then they're like, wait, 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 maybe this isn't for me? We have an agent in our office now. She just sold this client a multifamily. The buyer lives there. The client lives in this multifamily. Hired our agent to be not so much the property manager, but to walk them through how to rent it, and we rented the property for them, but has a P.O. box, doesn't want the tenants to know that she's the owner, although she lives there. <laughs> true story, right? Yeah, um, true story. And she doesn't want the headache. She's looking for a property manager. She wants nothing to do with it because it's a lot of work. So guys, this is a great way to build your investment portfolio, and the reason I think it's easier for us is because we're in the business right? But it's work. That's on camera also. <laughs> it's not easy. It is work. You have to be prepared for it. So let's talk about some of the best practices and what to be aware of. Prepare for vacancies and, and repairs. I love to see these breakdowns and someone's like, oh, this property is a great deal. It's off the market and you're going to cash flow this amount, but there's no vacancy factor. They're not factoring a vacancy rate. They're acting as if the property will be occupied 100% of the time, which is unrealistic but you have to factor vacancy rate. I like a higher number. I take 10% off as a vacancy rate. I'm not gonna receive 10% of that cash flow or monthly income as a vacancy rate. I also do that for repairs. If you bought a class A property, obviously it's a lower number. You bought a class B property, it's a higher number, but you have to factor for vacancies and repairs. So that property that I just gave you an example of with the no money down, one of the tenants winded up leaving while under contract because she didn't like the idea of a new owner. Worked out great for me because I updated the place and got more rents. But I put it on the MLS and it was the best experience. I had the agent screening my tenants. The reason I put it on the MLS was a couple reasons, but one, I felt that if a buyer, sorry, tenant is willing to pay a rental fee, they're a stronger tenant, right? Because the ones that are like, oh, no, I will not pay a rental fee. I can't afford it. I don't want that tenant. So one, it got me a stronger tenant because they're able to pay. They're willing to. They see the value in it. Put it in the MLS. Second is I didn't have to go there 50 times to go show it. The agents did. Right? Landlord pays half. Tenant pays half. So take care. let the tenant take care of you. I'm my own landlord. I don't need to pay myself through this, but the agents went and showed it. Then they gave me these nice NTN reports. I got their credit check. I got their background check. I got their eviction history without me having to ever do anything, right? So my colleagues and peers in the industry did all the screening for me and found me a good tenant. And because I had it that the tenant had to pay the rental agent side, I got a better tenant that is, has the means and isn't living check to check where they didn't mind paying half a month's commission. So let the industry do the work for you. This is why we have some intellectual knowledge and access to things that makes it easier for us and why we should do this. 
Line up your tradesmen. That whole story with the snow removal, it's true. So I actually, when my guy got back, um, I think I, I had my wife ask him, are you taking any vacations this winter season? Because I need to get someone else lined up, right? But don't wait to the last minute. You will need trades, tradesmen, handymen, electrician, plumbers, etc. Unless you're very handy yourself, you'll need to have that lined up. Be strict with tenants. Anyone here ever been in landlord tenant court? Show of hands. Have you ever seen that landlord that gets up and he's like, yeah, my tenant hasn't paid me for six months. And then you hear this number and you're like, ouch, right? Be strict with tenants. Do not take the non-payment stories of why as a personal problem for you because it be, will become a financial problem for you. Don't allow it to get that far. Fix it once, fix it right. Don't do patchwork. It's your house. You're eventually gonna have to fix it. So fix it once, fix it right. And keep records because you can sue your tenants after they are evicted, win a judgment, and go as far as garnishing their wages. And yes, I've been a part of an investment where we had to garnish wages. But you have to keep records because you will need their social security, their job info, uh, but you can go as far as garnishing wages. So you're, it's not always a loss. So I have this quote. Um, it's trademark, guys. I don't want to hear anyone repeating this. But all kidding aside, if you don't show up and care, your tenants won't keep up and care. I also use it for contractors. If you don't show up to the job, don't expect them to. But if you don't show up and you want to be the landlord that just comes when it's the first to the fifth and collect your rent, you're going to get there and one day there's going to be eight satellite dishes because your three tenants decided they wanted direct TV for the football package. And you're going to say to yourself, I didn't approve of these holes in my roof or siding. But you don't show up, right? You hadn't been there in a couple months. Like it's great to have Zelle. It's great to have direct deposit from Section 8. It's great to have your tenants um, paying you remotely or online or mailing you the checks, but you still have to go. Because if you don't, they'll have the backyard set up in the front yard, there'll be garbage all over the place, and you're gonna be like, this isn't the property, the Class A property I bought. So you have to be involved. It's not a sit back and the checks will come, there is work. So let's go to like the cheat sheet, the tenant cliff notes. Define everything in a lease. That whole joke of uh, satellite dishes is true. That's not in the lease and you get there and there's a bunch of satellite dishes. What are you going to tell your tenants? Take it off? Well, you didn't tell me I couldn't put it. It's not in the lease, right? Everything needs to be defined. Always take documents and photos. I'm sorry. Always take photos and have everything documented. Have your photos. Here's the before. So when the after doesn't look like that and you need to keep some of their security or keep their security, or they argue with you that it was like that, you have photos to, to verify it. Make tenants in a, we've all seen this in the MLS, right? Show of hands, tenant is responsible for the first $100 of repairs, very common. Do that, because then you're not getting the call of showing the light bulb. So I always, I always define it with the tenant because some tenants will push back at that or ask a bunch of questions, which they should. But you could say, listen, if it's wear and tear, that should be the owner's responsibility, it's mine. But if you break the shower handle because you guys are pulling on it and it's a brand new shower handle, well, I'm not doing that. If you guys are slamming doors and now the door flies off the hinges, you guys shouldn't be slamming doors. What I'm saying, what I'm getting at is it a little bit of a gray area there. It is a gray area. But I'd rather negotiate it and set the precedent that I expect you to maintain it well versus not having that. I, I put it in because it you know, makes them a little more accountable. They have Correct. To the game to the Correct. And I have had literally tenants call to change a light bulb. <laughs> so that takes care of that, right? And, and listen, you have someone that just moved out of their parents' house and they don't understand these things, it happens, right? They don't know. So that takes care of that. Um, learn court terms. This is, 
actually a very good thing if you don't know. In a lease, court fee, uh, late fees and any court costs for filing for eviction, that has to be labeled additional rent. And if it's not labeled additional rent, most of the counties, specifically Union and Essex County, you cannot charge the late fees, the court cost. So it has to be labeled. So you need to learn those things. And you don't have to be the bad guy. I get it, managing properties, we don't learn that in real estate school, um, being a property manager when we're getting licensed. But I'll give you guys a couple quick and easy tips of the trade. You don't have to be the bad guy. When you go to your tenant for the rent and they say that they just got laid off, the job messed up on their check, uh, they had to take in a family member, there's a death, car broke down, true story. I had a tenant once say, well, you know, it's the holidays. I had to go Christmas shopping. <laughs> Listen, I appreciate the honesty. And at that point, you don't want to necessarily, necessarily be the bad guy. Push it off. So I do two things. I'll either say, listen, my bookkeeper keeps accounting of everything and she will automatically file for eviction. So just letting you know. Or my favorite to do is this. Well, Olivier, you know, my car broke down. I needed to fix my car to get to work because if I don't work, I can't pay you. So you got to give me a couple weeks because my car broke down. I'm sure you understand. And I say, listen, I get it. Your car broke down, but here's what I'm going to do. Here's my phone. I'll call Wells Fargo. And I want you to tell Wells Fargo that your car broke down and that's why you can't pay me. And if they give me a pass that I don't have to pay my mortgage this month and there's no late fees, then it's all good. So here, and I gesture the phone to them and they freeze. And they're like, oh, well, no, well, no, I, I, that's not gonna work. It's like, okay, so I gotta proceed accordingly, right? So you don't have to be the bad guy. They think that landlords are just pocketing the money, going on vacation, and that's not the case. Remind them, there's Bank of America. They're on my back. So if you want to talk to them and you think that they're going to give you a pass, that's great. But if not, I got to proceed accordingly. So don't take it on because they'll give you the sob stories. I've had tenants cry. I've, had, I've seen it all. Uh, it's not your problem and you don't want it to become your problem. You got to do what's financially best for you. But I get it. You don't want to be the bad guy. And you don't want them to get vindictive right, and trash the place, blame the banks, blame your attorney, B blame your accountant, blame your bookkeeper. You don't have to take that on. Do it in a nice way. Do it in a funny way. I've, I, the looks on their faces when you pass them the phone, like you call Bank of America and you see if that's okay. <laughs> it's priceless, right? So I'm not the bad guy anymore. It's big old bank. Let's talk about some portfolio building. We're going to get into some numbers. Um, now that we've kind of walked through the process, right? We talked about raising capital. We talked about what properties to buy. We know how to manage them. Uh, how do you continue to grow that? So if you purchase a $300,000 property, let's call it a four unit with 20% down, and those deals are out there, because I just sourced one, $60,000 down payment. Hopefully it's coming from your savings, but if you're gonna be creative, um, <laughs> and you're gonna raise the capital somehow, structure a seller concession. $240,000 loan amount, because you have to put the 20% down. Your principal and interest is about 1350, give or take. So after you add in the other stuff, your insurance, your taxes, you're about 2,500 bucks. Right, easy numbers. So if you're draining rating $1,200 a unit, four units, brings you in a, a right under 5,000 at 4,800 a month. Take out the 20%, as I mentioned before. Take out 10% for vacancy rate, because you're not always gonna get that cash flow. Take out another 10% for repairs. And these numbers are high. A lot of people use 8% as a vacancy rate. If you bought a class A property, you don't really need that big repair escrow, right? Because it was a new construction or renovated already. But let's err on the side of caution. So your net is 3840 income. So you take the 3840, 
your monthly mortgage, which we just talked about, was about twenty eight, twenty five hundred. So now you're cash flowing about thirteen hundred bucks a month. That's ideal. Use the cash flow to pay off the personal loan if you took one or if you raised capital or if you had a money partner, pay them off first. You don't need to be paying interest on the interest, right? Pay them off first. That's why I don't recommend this unless you are experienced or very diligent and um, have the means because if anything happens, you gotta be able to float it and cover it all. Pay down the mortgage and save the cash flow to acquire property. Don't go buy the new car or the new bag or go on vacation. But you get that cash flow going. Again, you go through your cycles, you're five years in, you're 10 years in, you're 13 to 15 years in, and because you paid down some of the principal, you pay off property number one. Now you have a free and clear asset because prices go up. Yeah, there's cycles, there's a down market. But let's say with inflation, 13 to 15 years later, it's now worth, what you paid 300 for is now worth 400,000. You've paid it off. So now you're cash flowing $3,000 a month, right? After you pay your taxes, your insurance, your utilities, and whatever reserves you need. So if you look at that $3,000 a month and you still have your vacancy rate bit built into that, and you're making $36,000 a year from that property. I'm gonna age myself here for a second. Has anyone got those letters from Social Security where it gives you your estimated income? <laughs> If you retired today, no one could live off of that. It's depressing, right? Um, that's, and who knows if Social Security is going to be around? It better be because I paid into it. But who knows if it's going to be around? So if you can't see yourself living off that income, and for those of you millennials that haven't gotten that yet, you can actually go online and sign up to Social Security Administration and actually see what you would make today if you retired or had to stop working for whatever reason. Um, it's not enough to live off of. And if you don't want to join Silent Generation Realty and be selling at 80 because you need the income, uh, you got to look at investing and generating income and cash flow. So that one property that you bought 13 to 15 years later, you're making 36000 a year on it annually. But imagine if you pushed the envelope and got creative and acquired five properties, and you're making 180000 a year because you had five of those, right? We still have deals out there. I just sourced one. Imagine you had five of those. And at that point, you're 75, 80, whatever age you're at. You don't want to deal with it. You hire a property manager. Take 10% off the top. Still at 150000 give or take. Or take 20%, right? I'm still over 100,000 a year of cash flow of income. And now someone else is managing it. And what's great is you still have this free and clear asset. So that's why I believe in buying real estate as your investment portfolio. And as I mentioned before, why you always want to maintain these properties and keep them in great shape is you'll have an opportunity. And one of my uh, old bosses from my first real estate company and it was corporate and he was actually the sales trainer and I asked him how did you become successful he's a, a retired Navy SEAL really successful guy and he said I always positioned myself for an opportunity I was always ready for an opportunity and it stuck with me so you have this property you're maintaining it a better deal comes up if you're not positioned you can't buy it if you are positioned there's a lot of cool things you can do by the way, for those people that love to flip properties and flipping's cool, it's in, it's typically about 32% capital gains tax on short term, under a year. But there's ways with the 1031 exchange where you can roll that investment property in and defer your taxes. So you have more money to invest, you grow your capital, you grow your, um, your portfolio, through some of these um, strategies, which we're really going to just touch on, because we might do something on 1031s at some point. I know we've done them in the office. Uh, but 1031 exchange allows you to roll in the profits and push back the taxes 
from buying one property to another. So rather than selling a property, paying the taxes on it, you're rolling it into the next. So all that money gets rolled in. So you're not paying that 32% tax just to sell a property. Another are opportunity zones, and this is something new that came up this year. And these are great, because if you buy a property in an opportunity zone and you hold it for at least 10 years, there is no capital gains tax. So in 10 years, your $300,000 property is worth $400,000. That $100,000 of profit, if you did decide to sell it, if it's in an opportunity zone, you're not paying capital gains tax on it. So easy math, 32% of 100 grand is $32,000 that you're not paying. So there are some great tax shelters and safe havens if you are looking to build a portfolio and you're rolling one property into the next. And that's where you're growing from a two family, maybe into a five, six unit, right? You're selling your four family, buying a commercial 20 unit building, but you have to be positioned. And one of the things I talked about is you gotta have your taxes done. So if you have everything in line, you'll be ready for the opportunity. So that's really it on my uh, investment planning. Let's open it up to any questions. Comments? <laughs> well, we got to shout out the birthday boy. Uh, but yes, I want to definitely thank you guys for coming. Um, as you can see, this is something near and dear to me. I'm very passionate about it. And we all go through these cycles and we're selling real estate and we're doing great. But no one takes a step back to invest. And we have the access. We have more opportunity than almost anyone because we have the inventory, we have the intellectual knowledge, we have the loans, we have the products, we have loan officers. Um, it's just raising the capital, capital and getting down and doing it. And even the doing it, you know, so many property managers are realtors. Why not manage your own property, right? And there's a lot of fringe benefits to this. You get that good tenant and they're paying you two grand a month or 1500 or whatever. Hey, you wanna roll them into a buyer? You can, right? Hey, let me help you buy a home. So there's a lot of great benefits to this that I didn't even touch on, but I'm a strong believer that uh, look at it. Just see if it's something you can do, you're willing to do, and there's something for everyone. You don't want to ever pick up a nail or a hammer or a screwdriver. Get a condo, right? Get a home warranty on it. Line up your tradesmen. So there's a lot you guys can do with this so that that day comes, you can be off to wherever it is you want to be, walking the beach, and you have the passive income coming in. Thank you all for coming.